I'm Brian Robert Oliver. This is the Infinite 11's Anatomy of Horror. So we created this channel not only to celebrate the greatest filmmakers of the horror genre, both past and present, but also to help the average film viewer become aware of the filmmaking process. You might ask yourself why anyone would want to become aware of the process. Isn't watching a film a form of escape? My answer is it depends. Sometimes you get gifted the opportunity to watch a film made by what might be known as an auteur director, a director who has complete artistic control of their vision and their skill and talent are so overwhelming it takes a trained eye to fully appreciate everything their film has to offer. And no other genre lets this director have as much creative control as horror. Case in point, The Devil's Backbone, written by Guillermo del Toro, Antonio Trashoras, and David Munoz. And that's directed by Guillermo del Toro, and that's coming up next. At the height of the Spanish Civil War, Carlos, a sweet, inquisitive child, is left at an orphanage for boys. It is here that Carlos soon realizes that the orphanage is haunted by the spirit of a young boy who the other orphans refer to as the one who sighs. While the children contend with this ominous ghost, the staff of the orphanage attempt to reconcile the brutal realities of the war with their noble duties, shielding the eyes of the innocent who have already lost everything. This was the film that proved to everyone that Guillermo del Toro had arrived and that he was a seriously talented and visionary filmmaker. There is such a classic, elegant, and poetic style to this film. You can see elements of Orson Welles, Hitchcock, and F.W. Murnau. The steady, sweeping, and creeping camera work. The tall, deep shadows and the heavily arched, vast, and gothic setting. To me, this is a masterpiece, and it's the companion piece to del Toro's equally stunning masterpiece, Pan's Labyrinth. Both films were made with such care, such love, and you can feel that staring back at you through the screen. His style is so consistent and so balanced, even with such multi-layered content, such as The Devil's Backbone. So the setting. Somewhere between 1936 and 1939, during the Spanish Civil War, and this film focuses on the impact it had on the children, many of whom were orphaned and evacuated. And right away, we are explicitly told that this film is about a ghost, and it starts like this. ¿Qué es un fantasma? Un evento terrible condenado a repetirse una y otra vez. Un instante de dolor, quizá. Algo muerto que parece por momentos vivo aún. Un sentimiento suspendido en el tiempo. Como una fotografía borrosa. For the children, there is an actual ghost, an apparition or something that is dead, which still seems to be alive. But for the adults, their ghost is an implicit one, and it comes in the form of loss. In fact, loss is the overarching theme of the film and applies to all of the main characters. The orphans have lost their families. Carmen has lost her leg and her husband. Dr. Cesaris has lost his ability to fulfill his desires and carries with him the regret of past inaction. Visually, Del Toro ties everything together with a bomb. Dropped during an air raid by the Nationalist forces, the bomb hit its target, an open courtyard in center of the enclosed orphanage, but it does not ignite. Buried halfway into the earth with its tail exposed above ground, it stands like a statue, a constant symbol of everything lost and the expectation of future losses. This is the ghost, something that is dead which still seems to be alive, and the parallels to each sub-narrative are striking. Take Carmen, for example, the headmistress of the institution and the heart to Dr. Cesar's soul of the orphanage. She has lost her right leg, and in its place, a wooden, metal, leather-bound prosthesis. In a state of vulnerability, she expresses her loss. Esta pierna. No me gusta pensar en esta pierna. Me duele. Le di a 
cosas que no las soporto. Pero la necesito para tenerme en pie. What carries her is a great loss, but the pain of that loss is what moves her to perform such a noble duty. Also, Dr. Cesaris. A bomb is a phallic symbol, like this one, but it did not work how it was supposed to. Dr. Cesaris is a man of poetry and passion, but, like the bomb... Después de los 60, los hombres pagan lo que sea para... But no other character quite personifies the bomb as much as Jacinto, the caretaker and former orphan unable to escape the confines of the orphanage. The visual landscape for Jacinto is unique considering his impact upon the entire narrative. Every character with the exception of Jacinto and Jaime, the bomb stands tall above them in nearly every frame, this looming symbol of the destructive nature of war. And that is because for almost all of the characters, no problem is bigger and no pain is stronger than what this war has brought. But for Jacinto, this war that has eaten his country alive is no match for the enormity of his own anger. And that anger has driven him to desperation. So in this shot right here, we see that Jacinto is photographed higher in the frame than the bomb. So not only are we being told through the language of film that Jacinto's destructive ambitions supersede the casualties of war, but also that he is a bigger threat to those at the orphanage than the war. Now the lighting, and this is great. Both the bomb and Jacinto are backlit by the moonlight, but are otherwise shrouded in darkness, and this is to signify Jacinto's motives. But even better, notice the shadow of the bomb. It's pointing directly at Jacinto, letting us know that the two are the same. The bomb is a weapon of mass destruction, and though this bomb symbolizes all that has been lost, the children and faculty are safe from it. They are not safe from Jacinto. His anger and desperation have made him dangerous, and it is only a matter of time before he explodes. In another shot later in the film, we see Jacinto next to the bomb, and as you can see, he is lower in the frame. So you may ask yourself, are we getting mixed messages? Is Jacinto also in danger? Well, yes and no. The no is Jacinto's actions. Throughout the entirety of the film, Jacinto is angry, only smiling at someone else's pain. And even when he does smile, it's dark. But here we see him happy and even interacting with the bomb. He is legitimately having a good time, so he is visually being connected to the bomb, thus the personification of it. The yes in answering the question of Jacinto's safety is that there is someone else in the frame aside from Jacinto and Conchita, and that is Jaime. Notice that Jaime is photographed highest in the frame. Jaime is closely linked to Jacinto that not only does he share with Jacinto a boiling anger, a ticking bomb, so to speak, but he hates Jacinto and is in love with Conchita, Jacinto's girlfriend. So in keeping with Del Toro's visual story, Jaime's anger has overtaken him and his entire world, everything he loves, hates, and what has been taken away from him is right in front of him. So let's talk about the title of the film, The Devil's Backbone or El Espinazo del Diablo. This is in reference to a sequence late in the first act where Dr. Cesaris explains to Carlos the superstitious nature of Spain. Mira, Carlos, como puedes ver, soy un hombre de ciencia. En este país ha habido siempre mucha superchería. Europa entera está enferma del miedo y el miedo enferma el arte. Por supuesto, vas a saber cosas. En el pueblo, a esto le llaman el espinazo del diablo. Dicen muchas cosas, que esto le ocurre a los niños que nunca deberían haber nacido, los niños de nadie. No, no es verdad, no. Miseria y enfermedad, eso es, nada más. Este líquido en que flota se llama agua de limbo. First, notice the color of the liquid the unborn fetus is lying, the limbo water, as Dr. Cesaris calls it. It's amber colored, resembling... Como un insecto atrapado en amba. It's also the same color as the well water in the basement where more than a few characters find themselves in. The only people that come into contact with this water are orphans, both past and present. Dr. Cesar says that the fetuses in the limbo water are called nobody's children, and that by drinking the devil's backbone, it will cure all of their ailments. Del Toro is implicitly stating that the people of Spain have foolishly sacrificed and abandoned their children as if that would magically save their country. This is the power of Del Toro's film language by creating this tragic symbol, giving it meaning and then directly linking it to the most consequential characters in the film. And using the term limbo to describe this superstitious cocktail is clearly not without meaning and further connects another important character to the bomb, that's Santi. Santi is caught between two worlds, the living and the dead. 
just as the bomb is, stuck halfway into the earth and halfway out. Now about Guillermo del Toro's style, or the way in which he chooses to tell this story, his balancing of the text and the subtext. In other words, what is being said and what is being shown. Though we see that the story is told through multiple points of view, we find out that there is an omniscient narrative device, or a godlike narrator. And that is introduced at the very beginning of the film and reinforced at the end when Dr. Cesaris describes for us what a ghost is. And Dr. Cesaris, as we come to find out, is a poet, or at least appreciates the art form. And that is the style in which the film is told, poetry. The camera's eye moves in elegant patterns, constantly floating above its subjects, then gracefully swooping lower to change its point of view. And though there is a creeping quality to it, not unlike many horror films, it adds layers of sadness and beauty, things that might be lost if told in another way. This poetic style is not only limited to the camera's movement, but also reinforced by the on-screen action and pacing. The characters all move in a careful manner, slow and deliberate. I mentioned earlier that Del Toro's style is reminiscent of classic cinema, elements of Hitchcock and as well as Orson Welles. So right after a beautiful opening sequence, we get right into the story. And there is this really great shot that is not only a perfect representation of the film's overall style, but also a great representation of how to tell a story on screen. So much is happening in this shot. The shot begins and it's neutral, seemingly static, or at a fixed position. The angle is neither high nor low, but as the car approaches and fills the frame, we are now at a low angle, like how a child might perceive it, and it's a little overwhelming. Now pay attention to the movement of the camera. It's floating like we were watching the action through the eyes of a ghost. See this man right here? He means business. We know this because right away, he is high in the frame. He looks powerful. Something or someone has caught his attention, and when we peek low, we see him grab a sawed-off shotgun or rifle and watch how he grabs it. He takes out a bag with it because it hides the gun, and then he drapes his jacket over it like he's done this a thousand times. But you have to ask yourself, why is he hiding this? The answer is clearly that they are not exactly in a safe place. Now here is Carlos, a very important character, and we see much of the film through his eyes and our angle for him is perfectly neutral, as if this shot was made just for him. He looks so sweet and innocent and curious, and it's intensified when juxtaposed against the image of the large imposing man hiding a gun in the previous frames. And this is just a perfect use of framing. We are at an angle that captures Carlos perfectly through the rear windshield and windows, what is known as a frame within a frame. This is probably a little bit of foreshadowing. Del Toro is putting him in a box on screen to let us know that he is trapped. This also lets us know the importance of his character as well. We also know the other man we now see is important to Carlos, since he chooses not to follow the first man, but this guy right here. This man, Carlos's tutor, is wounded, so we know that along with the other man, these two men are battle-tested. So we follow Carlos and his tutor, and we get more information. Clearly, these men and boys are what the first man was looking at when he exited the driver's side of the car, and we know that these men that are working alongside the boys cannot be trusted, or at least are cause for alarm, and Carlos is none the wiser. Now we get a good look at Jacinto and his frame. He ends up high in the frame, and in keeping with the film language that has already been established, we know he is dangerous. So think about everything I've mentioned and watch the scene again uninterrupted. This shot sets the style, pacing, and adds in a ton of important information that we need as an audience without uttering a single word. So there it is. And my apologies for butchering these wonderful names. The Devil's Backbone stars Fernando Tielve, Marissa Paredes, Federico Lupi, Eduardo Noriega, Inigo Garces, and Irene Vicedo. Until next time. Hey guys, if you like what you see, then the Infinite 11 has a lot of great things coming up. So please like and subscribe.